experts. Can you take me through Genesis and the creation and oh, sure. show me the science? Well, um, I was taught the scientific method in grade one, grade two, grade three. We got it all 12 years. And so when I picked up this uh, book, uh, the Bible, I looked at the first page, Genesis 1. I said, this perfectly follows the scientific method. It took me nine years to discover why it so perfectly followed the scientific method. Right. That's where it comes from. It comes from the creation texts in the Bible and uh, Reformation theology. Uh, but I looked at, uh, you know, uh, Genesis 1-2. The Spirit of God is hovering over the surface of the waters of planet Earth. And it gives you four initial conditions. It's dark everywhere on the surface. The water is everywhere. And the planet Earth is unfit for life and empty of life. Well, steps one and two of the scientific method are do not interpret until you establish the frame of reference. The point of view is the surface of Earth's waters. And don't interpret to also establish the starting conditions. What's well, all laid out in Genesis 1 2? And I keep running into scientists who say Genesis teaches scientific nonsense. And I say, well, mm. Galileo said the biggest mistake you can make in Bible interpretation is to get the wrong point of view. And mm. when they say it's scientific nonsense, they think God is above the earth, looking down on the earth and telling us what he did. Instead, it's God on the surface of the earth looking up at the clouds and telling us what he did. Makes a huge difference in how you interpret the six days of creation. Okay. And so, but yeah, n nobody was helping on me on this. I just saw this in the text and said, okay. At 18. 17. 17. Yeah. Hmm. So, <laughs> so I said, okay, uh, creation day one, let there be light. And I said, well, that's when the atmosphere goes from opaque to translucent. Uh, I knew enough about astronomy to realize Earth had to begin with an atmosphere 200 times thicker than it has today. An atmosphere that thick will not let any visible light through. The sun and stars existed, but there was no light on the surface of the waters of planet Earth. Day one is when the atmosphere was thinned out sufficiently that light could come through. And it says the Spirit of God was brooding over the surface of the waters that implies the origin of life. So I saw life being originated at the beginning of creation day one. And then you go into creation day two, water above and water below. I really didn't have an idea what that meant. Uh, but when I got to the book of Job, it devotes one and a half chapters to creation day two. And basically describes it as God cycling water in the atmosphere above to the streams and lakes and oceans below, and then back again. Oh, my gosh. And actually describes six distinct forms of precipitation in Job 37 and 38. <clears throat> it mentions, for example, that there will be uh, dew and mist and rain, and then snow and frost and hail. And again, I had enough science under my belt to realize that's the only way you can have billions of people living on the surface of the earth. Because the Earth's water cycle is designed to ensure, no matter where you are, there's both frozen forms of precipitation and liquid forms, so we can have rivers and streams that fill our years round, and we have abundant food that can be grown everywhere. You need all six to make that possible. Then you get into creation day three, and this is when land masses show up for the first time, when God transforms the Earth from a water world uh, to one with continents and oceans. And uh, at 19, I got to take a course on plate tectonics. As far as I know, it was the first course in the world that was taught on plate tectonics wow. at a university. That's because two of the three physicists who launched the discipline were at the University of British Columbia. Hmm. Somehow I managed to get into that class as an undergraduate, and that's when they said, oh, the continents haven't always been here. It's plate tectonics that builds up the continents. And they thought it was a linear relationship from zero to where it is today. Today we know that it takes uh, deep oxygen cycle events to really accelerate the growth of the continental land masses. And so in 2018, they basically showed, yeah, for about the first billion years, uh, you've got nothing but water, and then plate tectonics kicks in. Uh, but at the first great oxygenation event two and a half billion years ago, about 90% of the continental landmass forms. 
Wow. And so basically it shows that the more we learn about the past history of the earth, the tighter and tighter fit we get with what the Bible taught about these land masses thousands of years ago. And then it talks about uh, vegetation on the land masses. And uh, I've debated the executive director of the Skeptic Society four times in university campuses. He always jumped on Genesis, no matter what we were talking about. Uh, and because he saw that as the Achilles heel of the mm -hmm. Christian faith. So he would always say, well, the fossil record shows us we got animals before we got vegetation on the continents. And I said, well, obviously, animals have skeletons and shells. That's going to be easily preserved. That's not the case for vegetation. It's going to decay. Right. But what happened in 2009 and 2011, two papers were published in Nature saying, we now have the isotope evidence, and in 2011, the fossil evidence that vegetation was abundant on the continental land masses 600 million years before the first animals show up. So again, it shows, hey, as we learn more, uh, it basically gives you a tighter and tighter fit. What would they have eaten if there was no vegetation, if there was no... Well, I think Michael Shermer was saying, yeah, there would have been vegetation in the oceans, but the biblical text says okay. vegetation on the land oh, masses. Land. Okay. He said, we have no fossil evidence of that. Well, we didn't during my first debate, uh, but we do now. We do have that evidence. Mm. And then uh, creation day four is when uh, creatures on the surface of the earth for the first time can see the sun, moon, and stars. And we now know the second great oxygenation event turned Earth's atmosphere from a dense haze to transparent. It's oxygen that determines how transparent the atmosphere is. And so experiment was done where they took the atmosphere of the earth, started with less than 1% oxygen and pushed it up. Well, the second great oxygenation event, the oxygen level suddenly goes from 2% to 8% for the first time in earth's history. That's enough to make the atmosphere transparent. Unbelievable. That's exactly the same time that the first animals appear. Animals can't function if they don't know where the sun, moon, and stars are in the sky. Mm. They need a transparent sky. Uh, but what we see in the fossil record, the very moment oxygen hit that minimum level for animals, animals suddenly appear. You go from nothing but microbial life to animals as big as two meters across. And then in creation day five, you also have God creating the sea mammals and the birds. Only the second time it uses the word create. The word create in Hebrew, baraz, for something brand new at God's hand. And what was brand new was animals that are not just physical, but soulish, and that they have mind, will, and emotions, a capacity to form relationships with one another, their offspring, they sacrifice for the offspring. They also are endowed with a capacity to form relationships with a higher species, namely us human beings, and to serve and please us. Mm. Then you get into creation day six, it doesn't talk about the first land mammals. It talks about the three categories of land mammals that are essential for launching human civilization. And Job 38 and 39 goes into that in great detail. Uh, and it's the short-legged land mammals, the rodents that we need for the clothing that humans were critically dependent upon when they first appeared. Because we humans, unlike the Neanderthals, right. are not adapted for a cold climate. We're fine in a warm climate, but not a cold climate. Mm -hmm. The rodents enabled us to go into cold climate zones. And two different kinds of long-legged land mammals, those that are easy to tame, the herbivores we use for agriculture, those that are difficult to tame, the carnivores that we use for household companions. And last of all, God creates human beings, and only the third time does it use the word create. Because what's brand new about us, we're not just physical and soulish, we're spiritual. As these birds and mammals were designed to relate to a higher species, we are designed to relate to a higher being, the one that created everything. First of all, that's the best explanation of Genesis I've ever heard. I love that. Um, the um, Let me go back. Where would the dinosaurs come in? Well, the Bible uh, is written for all generations, so it avoids vocabulary that only modern generations would understand. Yeah. So it doesn't mention dinosaurs because they weren't discovered until the 1850s. It doesn't mention protons or neutrinos either. But it, yeah, it doesn't mean that they didn't exist. They would have fit in in the middle of creation day five 
and where you see them implied is Psalm 104, the longest of the creation psalms. And Psalm 104's theme is that God is packing our planet with as much life as possible and as diverse as possible. And so when our planet has conditions suitable for dinosaurs, he creates the dinosaurs. They're not suitable now because we don't have shallow seas to provide the water buoyancy that these huge creatures need. Mm -hmm. But when the continental land masses were filled with vast shallow seas, there you got the water buoyancy to Mm -hmm. make possible animals as big as T-Rex and Brontosaurus. I mean, I I laughed at the uh, Jurassic Park movies because it shows this T-Rex on land chasing a Jeep at 45 miles an hour. It wouldn't have happened. The the T-Rex would have injured itself. One little trip and it's gone. It has no hands to do this. (laughs) (laughs) Well, the biggest land animal you can have without water support is an elephant. Anything bigger than an elephant is going to injure itself because of the law of gravity. Mm. It's the same law you see in the NBA. The really tall basketball players, when they trip and fall, they do themselves a lot more injury than someone who's only five feet tall. Mm. You know, gravity always wins. So I've never seen that even portrayed with dinosaurs, that they're always around water. Well, uh, the ones that are weighing 80 tons, they need water buoyancy to support that huge body mass. T-Rex was probably, I mean, it was long-legged. T-Rex was probably swimming around in shallow seas and preying on, you know, huge herbivores. I mean, wow. With those giant jaws, it wasn't eating small creatures like <laughs> yeah, lawyers. <right. laughs> it was eating something bigger than a lawyer. <laughs> um, so the other thing, and I, I just, I, I want to say this because there's a lot of people that have different views of creation and everything else. Sure. I personally don't think how God created the universe is essential to my salvation. So, and I don't know, you don't know, but we're... That's who creates that's essential. Yes, right. So, when and um, how, uh, right. that's, that's less important. Because I have some friends who claim, no, the earth is only, you know, five or 10,000 years old. And you're like, dude, that doesn't, I mean, no. Why couldn't God's creation happen, um, I don't want to say in an evolution, well, you say it's a progressive Creationism, right? Well, I claim that God uh, performs creation miracles. I mean, he uses the word bara and asa in the Hebrew. That means that God is supernaturally intervening. Sometimes it uses the word haya, which means that it could be through natural process. So it's not either or, it's both right. and. Right. So, but it is over a significant passage of time. In fact, just reading the Bible on my own uh, at age 17. I immediately recognize these days have to be long time periods sure. for the simple reason that you see the word day uh, being used with three different definitions. Creation day one, it uses the word day for the daylight hours. Creation day four, it's contrasting seasons, days, and years. That's day is 24 hours. But Genesis 2-4 uses the same word day for the entirety of creation history. Mm. The other thing I noted is that the first six days end with an evening-morning phrase. Evening was, morning was, day X, which told me each day has a definite start time and a definite end time. You get to day seven, there's no evening-morning phrase, implying we're still in God's seventh day. And both Psalm 95 and Hebrews 4 explicitly declare we're still in God's seventh day. And for Mm. me, at age 17, it answered the fossil record and enigma. For some reason, my parents thought I was being obsessive about physics and astronomy. I didn't know why, but they were worried. (laughs) (laughs) Did you kiss a lot of girls at all? No. No. (laughs) What a surprise. (laughs) I mean, I was saving saving up pop bottles and cashing them in to build a telescope. That's amazing. I began doing research on T-Tari stars, wound up entering the BC Science Fair and winning the fair. Uh, So... I was a real nerd growing yeah. up. I really enjoyed my astronomical research, but my family uh, was worried that I was being too narrowly focused. When I was 11, uh, my parents bought us a big, thick book on evolutionary biology. Mm. I was the only one in the family that read it. But I remember <laughs> telling my parents that numbers don't work. You have all these new families and orders and classes and phyla showing up before humanity, and none of that happens after humanity. 
They said, go ask your science teachers. They had no clue. They told me to talk to the professors I knew. And I didn't get an answer for them either. But the first time I picked up the Bible, read Genesis 1, I said, this answers the fossil record enigma. For six days God creates. On the seventh day he ceases from his work of creation to focus on his work of redemption. And I also realized that's the principle of the Sabbath. Mm. For six days we work. On the seventh day we focus on the most important issues of life. And as I read through the creation text, I was surprised to discover God begins his works of redemption before he creates anything at all, which implies everything that God creates is for the purpose of redemption, and it made sense of the seventh day when God stops creating and redeems. It also explained to me why so many astronomers believe in God and so few few biologists believe in God. Their research is on different days of creation. In astronomy, our data comes from the past because it takes light time to reach our telescopes. The field biologists are doing their research in the present era. So the field biologists say, we see no evidence for the miraculous handiwork of God. Well, they're looking on the wrong day.